tough crowd today. All right, in your bulletins, there's an outline in there for you. If you want to follow along, kind of fill in the blank, help you track along today's message a little bit. We're looking at, the sermon title is The Epistle of Straw. The Epistle of Straw. When I was a, well, young, let's, let's say younger than I am now, from the age of kindergarten through fifth grade, so five years old all the way through roughly ten years old, I attended a one-room Christian schoolhouse at Plano Christian Academy. Plano, Iowa was one of those towns that had about a hundred people, all right? Small little town, and we had a building that was right next to the post office, this little one-room brick building, and we met there for school. We, uh, we actually used homeschool material. We had a teacher that came in that local parents had hired to come in and teach their kids. There was, at its peak, 18 students, K through 12th grade. All right? Really small class. But it was fun interacting as a young man, because as a young boy, really, because you got to interact with all levels of students. It wasn't just your class. In fact, I was, for years, I was the only student in my class. And so it was just one of those things, you just happened to be there, right? Well, in the wintertime, when you couldn't go outside to recess, they didn't force you to do that in those days, we had the pastime of playing chess. Now, I don't know how many of you guys like playing chess, but I'm there, okay? I love playing chess. I'm not near as good as I once used to be, but I love playing chess. Now, when I first started out, chess was one of those games that, you know, you tended to focus on different pieces, right? You love the queen. The queen's beautiful. The queen's gorgeous. Protect the queen, right? And so I would fixate upon my queen and try to take out the other guy's queen, knowing if I can get rid of her, then that's my biggest opponent I got to take out. That was kind of my strategy when I first began playing chess. And so you would lose focus of the board, right? You tended to lose what everything else was doing, focusing on this one corner. And when you did that, inevitably you lost the game. Because you've got to stay focused on what the whole thing is doing. <laughs> the epistle of straw. Today we're talking about the book of James. The book of James, the epistle of straw. And I give this illustration about chess because James is one of those books where if you focus on one aspect, you lose focus on the whole thing. Does that make sense? And as we get through this, we're beginning this series in the book of James, we're going to be looking at the whole thing, keeping the whole thing in context, or in the back of our minds, as we look at how the little sections fit in on the game board, so to speak. Before we begin, let's open up in prayer. God, I thank you just for this book that you give us. Lord, as we study it today, I pray to give us wisdom as we just give this oversight of the book of James, this bird's eye view, so we can just kind of see the board, so to speak. Give us your wisdom today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Epistle of James, that's kind of a weird title, but Martin Luther, when he first began studying God's Word and things like that, he called the Epistle of James the, epistle, the, the straw epistle. He says, St. James' epistle is really an epistle of straw, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. Martin Luther said that about the Epistle of James. Was he was looking at it, he said it doesn't fit with God's Word. In fact, originally, he struggled with its canonicity. In other words, he thought, does this book even belong in the Bible? It doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to him. Now, it's interesting, later on in his life, he began to see the wisdom of James, and he then recognized it for what it was, this beautiful book, fitting within the canon of scriptures that God has given us. But the problem is that when you first look at it and you begin to fixate on different passages in there, you lose your focus. So today, before we start this series on James, we're going to look at the whole thing. We're going to draw a picture of the board so that you guys can understand first what the playing field is. And then we'll make all the little pieces fit within rhythm. All right, we're going to help you guys understand that. So this overview today, this is what this kind of the theme is. The book of James... While one of the hardest epistles to understand is full of wisdom and practical theology. It's full of it. Wisdom and practical theology. In fact, James is called the New Testament version of Proverbs. Okay? Proverbs is wisdom literature. James is also referred to as wisdom literature. All right? Understanding the background behind the book as well as common themes and elements can help one have a proper understanding then of some of the problem passages. And I'll give an illustration of what some of those problem passages are here in just a minute. But understand that there are some problem passages in James. But if you have an overview of what the book talks about, it helps all those things fit. It makes everything fit for you. All right. 
So the author of James, we have, there's two, there's two good options for the author of James. You got James, the son of Zebedee, or you have James, the half-brother of Christ, all right? The half-brother of Christ, meaning, well, obviously we understand that God, the father, was Christ's father. Joseph was not his physical father. So James was from Mary and Joseph, was from the union of Mary and Joseph. So you have James, the half-brother. Now there's evidence for why we believe that James, the half-brother of Christ, was the author. One of those was James, the son of Zebedee. He was martyred early on. The early 30s, AD 30s, was when he was martyred. Okay, And so he doesn't really fit that very well. As we look at James, the half-brother of Christ, there's these four things that we look at for evidence. One is that he was head of the Jerusalem church. James, half-brother Christ, was head of the Jerusalem church. So we look at that, and we see somebody who's got, he's, he's well-respected in the community. That's the type of person that would write a letter like James, the book of James, right? The language in this book matches the language that we find in Acts chapter 15. In Acts chapter 15, which is the council of Jerusalem, this is a recording of the council of Jerusalem, where the Jews, they came together and they said, what do we do with the Gentiles? The Gentiles who want to believe, do we make them become Jews first by circumcision? Or do we just let them become believers based on their faith alone? What do we do with this? And James got up and was very eloquent in his answer to this and how, and how they should proceed. And the language that he used in that speech in Acts chapter 15 matches a language in the book of James. In addition to that, no other James fits as well. I mean, to be logical, no other James fits as well as that James himself. All right? Okay, so most evangelical scholars... We believe that it was written before A.D. 49, making it the earliest book written in the New Testament. The earliest New Testament book. There are some implications in that, all right? But what's our evidences for that? Why do we say that it was written before A.D. 49? Well, here's the main reason right here is this. It does not mention the Council of Jerusalem. The Council of Jerusalem was a big event for the Jews because that meant that Christ, the message of the gospel, was no longer just for the Jews, this was a big deal to them. Prior to this, it was unlawful for the Jews to associate with the Gentiles. Peter says that in Acts chapter 10. All right, you can see evidences why this was such a huge event for them when all of a sudden they began to reach out to the Gentiles. James does not mention that. That's a pretty big event. And for that not being mentioned, we think that it was written prior to AD 49, which is the Council of Jerusalem. All right? It does not mention the Gentiles, which implies a date prior to Paul. So understand the implications there. James was written, obviously, before Paul was, because Paul was a missionary to the Gentiles. That's what Paul is known as, a missionary to the Gentiles. That's what he did, his three missionary journeys. He went outside of Jerusalem, and he ministered to the outside world, the Gentile nations. All right? And then in addition to that, James is martyred in AD 62. Now, you said there, well, he could have written in AD 59. Yes, he could have. But I'm just saying that, again, we see when James is martyred, we're understanding these other implications that are going on there. This is further evidence that it was an early book, and we believe earlier than all those other events that happened, such as the Council of Jerusalem and those things, prior to Paul beginning his ministries and all those events, all right? So this is why we believe that James is the earliest book that was written. So as you understand James, you've got to understand, when you pick this book up and you read through the book of James, that this was the first New Testament book written, all right? So there's none of those other books that were out there at this time. And James was writing, was writing, was writing to, to whom? He was writing the 12 tribes. He says that, the 12 tribes, the Jews. But then he goes on to define that a little bit further by saying this. He says, I'm writing to my brothers. Now, in the New Testament, who are my brothers? Was it my Jewish brothers or was it my Christian brothers? Well, in the New Testament, when we read the word brothers, we understand that in the context of the New Testament, the word brothers refers to Christian brothers. Okay? Not the physical genealogical brothers as much as the Christian brothers. He says, I'm writing to the 12 tribes, but then I'm writing to my brothers. So he's writing to believers. The book of James was written to believers. All right? I want you guys to see this board. I want you, as you're picturing all the passages of James, understand that the first thing we got to know is that the book was written to believers, to believing Jews, but written to believers, okay? That's the context of this. So all those passages that are in there are references to Christians. They, they're, they're written for Christians. So what's the major theme? And this is where we kind of get in some difficulties in the book of James because there's a couple things out there. Some evangelicals, John Piper is one of those, um, there's many to mention, that they believe that the book of James was written as tests of genuine salvation. 
when you read through James, they say, okay, all these things that James mentions in here, the different categories, as we're going to call it, that he talks about, these, were, these are tests how you can know you're saved. All right, so as you look at James and you read some of the different passages, you think, okay, that's evidence for the fact that I am a believer or evidence for the fact that I'm not a believer. Okay? That's one of the understandings of the book of James. That's one interpretation of the book of James. Or somebody like Zane Hodges, for example, Charles Bing is another one. They see it this way, which is wisdom for living the Christian life. That James, being written to believers, is full of wisdom for living the Christian life. Okay, it's a book, it's a wisdom book, we already know that, and so that's how they would understand that. Now, I'm letting you know right now, my opinion is that this book is written as Wisdom for Living the Christian Life. In fact, that's the title of the series, James, Wisdom for Living the Christian Life. It's written to believers, to those who already believe, and once you believe, you cannot lose your salvation, can you? The scriptures say that over and over and over again. So based upon that, then we know that it has to be practical wisdom for living the Christian life. Now, there's some verses in there going to throw us. We're going to look at some of those here in just a second, but we're going to talk about this. Some of the themes of James, nature, he mentions waves, wind, plants, sun, all those things. There's 30 references to things found in nature in the book of James. That's a common element, all right? These are things that he uses to describe the Christian life. In the context of the chessboard, you might almost see these things as pawns. They're, they're everywhere, right? What good are they? I don't know, but they do something, okay? James uses these references in nature to draw our attention to how God uses creation as well, to, to help us to illustrate some of the truths that he has, okay, to be able to see some things. He also mentions the believer's judgment 12 times. Now, this is something that many of us overlook, but the fact that judgment, the believer's judgment, is mentioned 12 times in five chapters. Now, that's a pretty big element in the book of James, isn't it? That's a pretty significant element. And so we have to keep that in mind. As we go through James, there are 12 references to the believer's judgment. There are also 15 references or quotes, if you will, the paraphrases of themes from the Sermon on the Mount. James would have been there. Let's look at some of these passages. Let's see what he says. Okay, as far as the believer's judgment, James 1.12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him, the crown of life. That's given at the believer's judgment. Paul describes this. We know there's a believer's judgment, a time when we will receive rewards for the things we do on this earth. James refers to this in James 1.12. James 2.5, listen, my beloved brothers, has, God, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? Again, heirs of the kingdom, talking about the believer's judgment. There's a time when we will receive our inheritance based upon the things that we do here on this earth. James 3, 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Again, written to believers, James says, look, if you want to teach, understand that you're going to be judged with a greater strictness. Now, this is the verse that terrifies pastors, and rightly so, because the things that I say, I'm going to be judged for, and it's very strict. It's very strictly, God's going to judge me for the things that I do. It's not going to be pretty, per se, right? Unless, of course, man, God, help me understand these passages. If we have a good, proper understanding, then we have nothing to fear. But if we twist scriptures to our own uses, to our own glory, then what happens? There's a strict judgment for that. Sunday school teachers are going to be judged stricter than their students will be. College professors, all those things. If you're a teacher, there's going to be a greater judgment. Now, John 5, 24 says, He who believes in the Son, what, what do you have? If you hear my word, believe on him who sent me, you shall not come into judgment, but pass from death into life. What does that mean? You shall not come into judgment. Well, that's a judgment for eternal life. The judgment that John is talking about, or that James is talking about here, is that judgment for our eternal reward. Not eternal life, but the eternal rewards, the crowns, those type of things that we take into eternity with us to later lay at the feet of Jesus. But there is a strict judgment for those of us who teach. Judgment is coming. James 4.12, there is only one lawgiver and judge. He was able to save and destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? Again, a reference to God being our judge, and then he says, look, if God's your judge, why are you judging? It's not your role to do that. James says this, who are you to judge your neighbor? In light of comparing yourself to God and who God is, we are nothing compared to God, are we? Absolutely nothing. James is like, why are you judging your neighbor? God's going to be the one to do that. 
in James 5, verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. These are just five verses taken out of the book of James that talk about the judgment. But do you understand how significant this theme is in James? It's a very significant theme. And then going to the Sermon on the Mount, those references, James 1, 9, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. James 1, 20, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Matthew 5, 22, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Are you seeing the themes? Anger? Meekness? For the judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Matthew 5, 3-5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. James 5.2, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Matthew 6.19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. James 5.12, but above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Matthew 5.36-37, do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Do you see the themes? Do you see the quotes that James uses? He's bringing this thing around. He's backing up what Christ has said. He's reinforcing those things. He's paraphrasing it. He's making it real to us, to us who are believers. So some of the problems that we have with James is, one, it does not seem unified in this theme. For scholars, as they look at the book of James, James is really, it seems scattered. He's kind of all over the place. You think, where is he going? He's talking about uh, how to deal with the rich, how we deal with the rich person versus the poor person. He's talking about how anger messes us up. He's talking about how faith and works fit together. He's talking about the dangers of the tongue. All those things seem scattered, and it doesn't seem unified. And so for many, like Martin Luther at the beginning, it was tough to make James fit. So that was a problem for them. James seems to teach justification for salvation comes through works. Now, what do I mean by that? Justification for salvation comes through works, all right? Listen to these verses in James. James 2.14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? What does that mean? Well, if I don't have faith, if I don't have works with my faith, am I saved? Right? That's, a, that's something that you would think, well, yeah, that's what, kind of what that verse is asking, right? James 2.17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James 2.21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? James 2.24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And you say, Pastor, what do you mean? It seems to teach justification by works. It says right there, a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. What do you do with that? And why is that a problem? Well, we're going to turn to Romans. If you want to follow along, you can. Romans chapter 3. There's a couple verses I'm going to point out to you. You can write these down and look them up later if you want to. But it's really interesting as you read these verses in light of these verses. And this is really, really what got Martin Luther up in a tizzy, okay? So Romans chapter 3, verse 20. It's interesting. It says, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Did you catch that? For by works of the law, no human being will be justified. And yet it says right here, you see a person is justified by works. Jump down to, to Romans chapter 2, Romans 2, 3, I'm sorry, Romans 3, verse 28. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Are you justified by works or justified by faith? Paul seems to say one thing. James says another thing. How do you put those things together? How does it fit? Well, I'll answer that, but not today. That's called a teaser. Okay. Titus 3, 5 says, you know, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. How does this fit? 
Do you understand some of the problems? Do you see why now, why the book of James is so hard for some scholars to understand? Because it doesn't seem to fit what we find in other books of the Bible. So does it contradict one another? And here's what's going on. And remember, remember the chessboard. You can't get focused on some pieces and forget the whole picture. Okay? James is not teaching a, the a theology contradictory to Paul's theology. He's not. As we go along in this series, you're going to see that. What are the problems we have in the book of James? Well, it seems to guarantee healings through faithful prayer. James 5, 13 through 18. All right? And there are churches that base their primary theology upon this, or theology of healing upon this. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Do you see where it seems like that's guaranteed? The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. A number of years ago, I don't remember how many years ago it was now, we were at a staff meeting there in Omaha at the church I was at and we were talking about an event that had just happened the day before. The Liberty Christian Center in Omaha, 60th and L, they had a funeral service. And the whole family there was for a young man who was, it was a tragic death, a young man that was there. During the funeral service, they picked him up out of the casket, propped him up in a chair on a stage, and had a healing service, believing Romans chapter 5. And for a couple hours, they had news stations there and everything, because the pastor swore, he said, this is going to happen, God guarantees it, it's going to happen. For a couple hours, they had a prayer service, a healing service, to resurrect this young man. Because James says, look, he says, the Lord will raise him up. And God's word is true, so we're going to do it because God's word is true. Now, do you believe God's word is true? Yes, absolutely we believe God's word is true. Why else would we be here today unless God's word is true, right? God's word is true. So is James teaching that guaranteed the prayer of faith will save the one? It's a good question, isn't it? These are some of the problems that we find in the book of James. Some of where this twisting comes in and we sit there and think, how does that fit with the whole of the scripture? I mean, we look at Paul who had that thorn in his flesh and he said, three times I asked God to remove it from me. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Who had better faith than Paul, right? And he still had something wrong with him. So this is where James and Paul, these two, they seem to conflict against one another. And how does it fit? Well, we're going to look at that during this series. But I'm just giving you an overview to understand why this book is so hard to understand for some people. For many, it was, for years it was hard for me to understand. It took a lot of study. A lot of study. And even now I don't fully understand it. As we get through this series, I'll tell you, you're probably going to have questions for me. You're going to say, Pastor, I don't understand what you said. And I'm going to say, that's okay, I don't really understand it either. But we're going to look at it and we're going to try to go through it together. And if you have questions, talk to me, okay? But we're going to learn through this. And we have to understand that one James word does fit within all of God's scriptures. It was inspired. Second Peter says all scriptures, it was inspired by God because no man on his own did this. But God, speaking through his Holy Spirit, he gave these to men. We understand that no man on his own wrote down God's word. All right. So what do we do? What do we understand through this? Well, as we study James, there's a few things to keep in mind. A few criteria to keep in mind. Is your interpretation consistent? Is it free from error? You know, does it contradict each other? Is it, does it contradict in different aspects? Is it free from error? Is it consistent, free from error? Is it coherent? Is it logical, in other words? Does it flow? You know, does A plus B equal C? Or does A plus B equal G.1? I don't know. Does it make sense to you as you go down through it? All right. Is it comprehensive? Does it apply to all the evidence? And is it congruent? Does it fit all the evidence? How many of you guys here like to watch Blue Bloods, the TV series Blue Bloods? Anybody Christians in this? Okay, that was a joke. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> that's okay. It's a TV show that's out there. We watch on Amazon Prime, Rachel and I do. Um, but in that, you've got, uh, you have the DA's office as shown in there. And one of the episodes we just recently watched, the DA's office had a little bit of conundrum among them because one of the attorneys held back some evidence because the evidence did not fit the verdict that they wanted. And so they withheld that one evidence. It didn't seem to fit everything else, so they held it back. In biblical interpretation, we oftentimes do the same thing. There's evidence that doesn't quite fit what we believe, and so we just kind of ignore that evidence. Well, you can't do that. 
And in the book of James, we have to make sure that the evidence that we see and our understanding of that fits not just the whole of the book of James, but the whole of Scripture. Because scriptures cannot contradict. And so we're going to go through James. We're going to try to make sure that all these four things are true in our interpretation and our understanding of what James is actually teaching. Is it consistent, coherent, comprehensive, and congruent? Does it fit all of those? And then finally, the last thing I want to ask you is, one, the book of James is wisdom for the Christian life. Wisdom for Christians. Because it's wisdom for Christians, I ask you, is it written for you? In other words, are you a Christian? Does this book apply to you? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5.8, God shows his love for us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. My question is, have you asked God to forgive you? Acts 16.31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Are you a believer who can benefit from the wisdom of James as he tells us how to live the life of a believer? How to live a Christian life? Is this book for you or are you on the outside looking in? I don't know the answer to that, but you do. And I want you to think about that and I want you to ponder that. Because it's not some song and dance you have to do. We've talked about this before. All it is is believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You can do that right there in your chair. Just believe, God, you died to forgive me. And God, I'm asking you to do that. That's it. I'm going to close in prayer. And if you've never done that, I challenge you to do that. But if you are a believer, I'm going to challenge you to say, God, help us as we go through this series the next several weeks. Help me to understand what James is saying. Help me to understand. God, we come to you today and we thank you for this book. And yes, it's hard to understand and there's some passages in there that, that seem to contradict other scriptures. And, and Lord, how does it all fit together? And God, we're going to need wisdom. Help us to get that wisdom. And then Lord, as we, as we even consider this whole fact of am I a believer or not? God, I, I pray that if there's one here today that's not sure, that they would not leave without knowing for certain. God, help them to make a wise decision. God, we thank you for this lesson we had today, just this overview of James. And we pray you to bless this series, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.